Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Institute of World Politics and Tamarian Series Lecture. Color after a false start, but in uh, a, 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 the late 20th century, he returned to power with a program to implement reforms, wholesale decommunization, and restoration of Magyar national pride that were a failure at. Uh, uh, immediately following the so-called collapse of communism or transformation of, uh, uh, of communism into uh, post-communism. So the latest, the latest developments in Hungary concern historical policy, media laws, uh, judiciary reforms, as well as uh, various issues about majority and minority groups, well, plus foreign policy, which I will touch on last. I don't know if any of you are interested in Hungary or no, but if, if you go to Budapest now, there is a new monument on Liberty Square. I'm sorry to say there is still a Soviet monument, an old Soviet monument, which uh, replaced, or which basically raped an old Hungarian monument which, uh, which
which commiserated over the Treaty of Trianon and all the lands Hungary lost as a result of World War I. The Soviets conquered Hungary in 1944 and they leveled that monument and put their own monument to the fallen Soviet heroes. It's still there. It's one of the very few Soviet monuments that remains in Hungary, but it's still there. Now, very close to it now, we have Ronald Reagan. Strong. It's mine. On liberty.
anybody, anybody used the military to protect Jews was when Admiral Horthy in Central and Eastern Europe sent in armored vehicles to the streets to stop Jewish deportations. Yes, he had allowed them to go on and then his uh, daughter-in-law and his um, family yelled at him and he finally came to his senses. He was not strong enough to do it immediately, but yes, this is the only time where anybody was willing to risk. I'm sorry, I can tell you this. When the Vichy France attempted to deport Jews from, uh, 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 from Italian-occupied southeastern France, Italian fascists sent their military to stop that because the French were interfering with their Jews. So yes, two times. An authoritarian monarchist uh, Catholic who used a threat of military force and Italian fascists. The only two times anybody did anything for the Jewish people in Europe, militarily. Well, I'm not counting the Polish Home Army, which assisted in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising by supplying weapons and uh, launching several diversionary actions, including blowing up the wall or attempting, but that was the underground, and they were on the Allied side. Italian fascists were not on the Allied side, nor was Hungary at that point. They were negotiating to do something. There is a lot of controversy, as far as historical policy in Hungary, about the House of Terror. I think it has 20, correct me if I'm wrong, 28 rooms? Two of them are devoted to uh, the Nazi occupation, and the rest are devoted to the communist occupation. And there's a lot of bitterness about it, that this is imbalanced. Well, I'm sorry to say the Nazi occupation lasted nine months. The communist occupation lasted 40 years. And the House of Horror, for the most part, concerns the travails of the Hungarian majority, the Magyars, not the Roma, not the Jewish community, not Poles in Hungary, there were plenty because the Hungarians gave them asylum, the Magyars, it's a museum for the Magyars, for the majority group. It is shocking because not only for 40 years of communist uh, occupation, but also for the next 25 years under liberalism or actually post-communism in Hungary, nothing like this could exist. And now with the Orban government, things have changed. The silent Magyars have spoken. You can imagine that powers that be don't like it because there is a visible paradigm shift which points the way for the rest of the post-Soviet zone, in particular those who are members of NATO and the EU, how one can get rid of post-communism, not just communism. Now let's move to media laws. I will shock you if I tell you that the government prefers media that are government owned. <laughs> and it prefers media that uh, even if they are independent, they like the government. It's very shocking. Uh, and you will be surprised when I tell you that there is no government advertising in opposition media. The horror. Of course the government has the taxpayers' money it's going to use its money to advertise in whatever it wants to advertise in. It's also shocking that as far as media deals, pro-government businessmen benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Kennedy didn't like newspapers, he didn't like subscriptions at the White House of newspapers that didn't write 
flattering stories about it. Ladies and gentlemen, FDR went after Mo Amenberg and Mr. Hearst with a vengeance. In fact, he put Mo Amenberg in jail for writing uh, disfavorable editorials about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was upset. How could media be like this? Uh, I, you know, when the post-communists and liberals were in power, I never heard anybody complaining that so-called independent media were pro-communist and pro-liberal. Never heard anybody complaining about Hungary then. I never heard anybody complaining that the so-called independent media in Hungary were living off of the taxpayers' money because they got free and they got advertising. No competition, only they got advertising. So long as they were liberal and leftist and post-communist, everything was honky dory. Suddenly, they no longer get the taxpayers' money to subsidize their newspapers or radio programs, etc., and everybody's mad. This is a violation of the freedom of speech. Well, I thought this was free market. If they were really so suave, if for 25 years they enjoyed the benefits of the free market, what happens when the government yanks out its advertising? They can't fly anymore? That means they don't belong in the free market. Get with the program. The New York Times bemoans all the artists. Then there is a quote from my head. Well, Budapest is so beautiful, it doesn't appear authoritarian at all, but all those starving artists. Really? I'd like a subsidy from the New York Times. For our school, I'll give it out as a scholarship for our students. This is just silly uh, to accuse Hungary of uh, being China and God knows what else. And, and Orban of being Putin because on the account of media laws. FDR packed the court. He packed every single institution he could. So yes, there have been judiciary reforms to get rid of post-communist judges, which were clogging the system and paralyzing any reform. It's true. But the judiciary continues to uh, rule this favorably towards the government. Yes, there are judges who are more sympathetic, but I don't see, I don't see a cause for alarm. Nothing that we're not familiar with. And I, I will uh, deliver a punchline about this at the, at the very end. So what is scaring every media outlet in the West of the so-called mainstream media? Well, it's the attempt by Orban and his people to build a society around, uh, uh, along the lines of national solidarity. Does he make mistakes? So of course he does. Internet tax was one. There were massive demonstrations. He's an etatist, so I know he wants to tax everybody. He's not a libertarian. I would expect him to do so. It was a huge mistake. And guess what? That fascist guy, Orban, backed away because kids demonstrated on the streets. He didn't send the tanks in. It was not Tiananmen Square. Didn't make the New York Times. Let's cut him some slack. Uh, but as I mentioned, he's rebuilding society along the lines of national solidarity. The minorities are de-emphasized. The majority, major, majority, is emphasized. There is affirmative action for the majority. Just like Josef Antal, and I approved of it, had a, an affirmative action for the pre-war elites. Because they had been downtrodden for so long, they needed a push. Orban opposed it. Now he's changing his mind. He knows that there must be continuity with the Magyar tradition. 
the Christian tradition it brags about it. This is in the Hungarian constitution, ladies and gentlemen. When I say minorities are de-emphasized, I mean that uh, a, they are no longer cuddled like they were, they were under the post-communist and the liberal regime. Sometimes it's unpleasant, for instance, the Jewish Museum, Memorial Museum, which uh, is an important institution in Budapest, returned uh, or not the museum, but one of the largest Jewish umbrella organizations returned all government subsidies to object to uh, the ways that the government proposes to commemorate the Holocaust. The Roma are sidelined and sometimes they are uh, subject, how should I put it, to official sneering, patronizing. The gays are without preferences. The greatest example of persecution of gay ideology and gay community that I had noticed in Hungary was that the government refused a couple of months ago to uh, affect a transfer of funds from Norway to Hungary's gay community. Because the government decided that uh, the Norwegians were butting in. I told the government to relax, take the money, tax it, and then go to Hungary, take the proceeds, and sponsor traditionalist Catholic missionaries. Norway needs it. The most popular name in Norway, male name is Mohammed. Yes, so Norway, yes, the Norwegians don't like to have children because children are a problem. I think, you know, the government of Hungary should sponsor Latin mass in Norway with its largesse. At any rate, the Hungarian government is busy empowering the minorities, but the Hungarian minorities in adjacent countries. It goes to bat for them about half a million Khan Hungarians, abating who live in, in, in provinces, abating Hungary, have the right to vote. And they vote. Most of them, of course, vote conservative. As far as Hungary's foreign policy, well, the, the country is ostracized by the US and EU. I don't know if you realize it, but we do not have, Washington does not have an ambassador in Hungary because we're boycotting Hungarians. We don't like what the Hungarians have to do. Yeah. Hungary is ostracized more than the Freiheit Partei in Austria was, which made the mistake of winning a democratic election. So nobody liked the Freiheit Partei of Haider. There is also a pronounced pro-Russian turn. Why? Well, for a variety of reasons, but mostly because we are ostracizing them, the Hungarians. So they turn, they have turned to Russia. And it mostly concerns energy issues. For instance, the Hungarian government uh, parliament has now voted to support South Stream pipeline, which would circumvent Ukraine. For some reason, uh, a number of media outlets singled out Hungary for acerbic criticism. Now, ladies and gentlemen, last I checked, the main uh, participants were Gazprom, Eni, which is Italian, EFD, which is French, and Winterzhal, which is German. And Hungary said, okay, we'd like some gas and some oil, please. But it's fashionable to bash the Hungarians. Not too many 
have stooped to uh, attack Western Europeans. Hung Hungary has also reversed the reverse. That means Hungary was sneaking gas into Ukraine and then decided against it. Because the head of Gazprom showed up and said, hey, we will give you preferential, tre uh, preferential treatment. You will get a break on gas supplies to tide you over for the winter. Well, I'm sure Orban's heart goes out to the uh, Ukrainian people as long as they give extensive autonomous rights to the Hungarian mi uh, minority, but he also would like Budapest warm. And the Russians are offering cheap gas. Nobody else has stepped up. We here in the Dakotas burn most of the gas we extract. And unfortunately, the powers that be have not yet decided to supply Western Europe and Europe, the EU, with energy so that nobody would have to go to Russia to keep warm. That's not Hungary's problem. I don't know why DC, Washington DC, is pouting about Hungary and pretends it's all about helping Ukraine. If it really is, then we should be sending our shale gas east. We're not. Hungary has also promised to buy nuclear, a nuclear reactor from Russia, financed by the Kremlin. I don't know if I would be all happy about Chernobyl technology. If I were in the EU, I'd be, I'd be trying to kiss up to the EU and buy from the French. Not that they have the best technology. We do. We have thorium-based reactors. Again, the powers that be in Washington, D.C. are not interested in nuclear power. So why pout? Why? Why? ostracize the Hungarians. It's all in our hands. We can do it. They wouldn't have to go anywhere else, just to us. All we have to do is want to help, because we can. And then we would have influence, actually, instead of playing the violin and pouting. Well, just to make things clear, this Putinesque Hungary, allegedly Putinesque, with its government, horrible government, is the result of a series of elections. <clears throat> Let me just talk about this year. In April, the coalition won two-thirds, over two-thirds of the seats. Looks like a clear democratic mandate to me. <coughs> right? Why did President Obama compare uh, Hungary to Egypt and China? Not so long. I think he, had a, he spoke about that in July. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because after the April elections, the coalition also won the EU elections. Yes. And to boot, there was just an election in October, self-government, local elections, they won that too. The vote was fair and square, it was not rigged. So what the heck is going on? Maybe we only like democracy if it sounds like the Washington Compost and the New York TAS. <laughs> Telegraphic agency of the Soviet Union, to those of you who are a little bit younger and don't remember. What I am concerned of is Magyar ethno-nationalism. I don't mind populist nationalism, I don't mind Christian nationalism at all, but it has to be inclusive. Ethno-nationalism is a one-way street, it's a cul-de-sac, in fact. What may be in the cards, and it has to be logically in the cards if Orban continues his way, is to reverse Trianon, and that's bad news and destabilization in a traditional sense. It's to bury communism and post-communism, and that's good news, and to trans-liberalism, which has had monopoly 
of culture and everything else since World War II. And that's, those two things are not so bad. Okay. Let's have a little musical break as we move on from Hungary to Ukraine and Belarus. Go ahead. Can we make it darker? Well, we can make it darker. Yes. Uh, louder. <coughs> that says res publica or Jespospolita. Si Deus non visco. If God is with us, who is against us? My ancestor, Jan Karol Holtkevich, 
start with the second sign. It collides. What language was it in? You can tell me. The second one was second Belarusian. One. It was Belarusian. Belarusian. They were both <laughs> Belarusian. They were both in a Ruthenian tongue, either Ukrainian or uh, you can liquidate that how you want to do it. Oh, we'll look at it later. You can min minimize it. So. Yeah, just uh, things. Uh, the second one was uh, Belarusian. And they were singing about our nobility, as in the Republic, the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. The Moscovites called those people Litovci. Why? Because they were denizens of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Most of them were Ruthenian. Rus, ladies and gentlemen. Just like the denizens of the Grand Duchy of Kiev were Rus. The Moscovites are denizens of a little muddy village in, in the east. And here, both from the Ukrainian and the Belarusian, the Belarusian side, we had a display of unabashed patriotism and nostalgia for the Commonwealth. When in those days anybody said Polish, one meant not ethnicity, but nobility. When I was uh, one time at Hotin, when my ancestors fought against the Ottoman Turks. There was a huge monument to Petro Konaszewicz Hajdacin, who was a Cossack general and a Polish nobleman, Orthodox by faith. He had a coat of arms and everything else. And I asked the locals, oh, where is the monument to Jan Karol Hotkiewicz, who was in charge? The Grand Hetman of Lithuania, the Grand Duchy. Silence, he was a Polish lord. I said, well, who else was the Polish lord? Uh, Prince Wisniewiecki. Ooh, I thought his mom was Moldavian and his dad was Ruthenian, meaning Ukrainian. Uh, how, why was he a Polish lord? Because he was a Polish lord. Well, everybody was a Polish lord in those days. Because they were all nobility if they fought. Including Chmielnicki. And all the Cossack officers were Polish lords. They were Pani, Polskie Pani, Panowie with coats of arms, but they were orthodox, by religion, sometimes uniates. At any rate, what you see here is absolutely unprecedented. It means that a portion of the Ukrainian and Belarusian public has been abandoning the ethno-nationalist approach. Completely unprecedented. They talk about the Commonwealth, Judge Pospolita. I am shocked. I'm very touched, too. They sing, where are our Polish lords? They don't mean, hey, let's return to serfdom. They mean the Commonwealth. The Respublica, Republic. This is, the, this is a proposition. For now, it has penetrated at the level of culture. But let me tell you, it also reverberates, or begins to reverberate, at the uh, level of scholarship. In Chernyovce, there is a uh, young political scientist, his name is Fyatoslav Wyszynski, who has begun writing about, yes, the intermarium, the lands between the Black and Baltic Seas. Uh, he has published recently an article called The Net Empire. You don't have to show it. The Net Empire. New Rus. He says, we're experiencing a crisis. The West is incapable of defending its eastern satellites. The war with Russia 
has dramatically changed the national consciousness of the Ukrainians. Why? Hey, most of the Azov battalion speaks Surajok or Russian. It doesn't speak the way that Western Ukrainians speak. So ethno-nationalists have to figure things out for themselves. The Ukrainian means identifying with independence of Ukraine. And by the way, did you know there was a Jewish Sotnya, a Jewish company fighting on the Maidan? So ethno-nationalism may not be the solution. Vyshinsky argues that the, because of the Russian aggression, the unitary nation-state no longer is a paramount goal. There is no need for a single language, an ethnic territory, as ethno-nationalists have proposed. He calls for a Ukrainian imperial project to counter the Russian imperial project. He also proposes polycentrism, autonomy of regions, and grassroots democracy. When I hear a Ukrainian saying grassroots democracy, you know what is meant by this? The Cossack way of democracy, with the stranice and grassroots developments, and it's all very good. It's a, it's a much wanted departure from Dmitry Donskoy uh, and his uh, uh, Donsev, I'm sorry, and his um, ethno eliminationist pagan ethno nationalism. Vyshinsky calls to organize the intermarium as yes, Rzecz Pospolita, Rzecz Pospolita. He says, let's have a Commonwealth back. In fact, he says Ukraine and Ukrainians are successors to Rzeczpospolita, to the old Commonwealth. He proposes to, I quote, to shift the center of organization of Eastern Europe and Eurasia from Moscow to Kiev and Warsaw. He calls for a union or a confederation or at least an alliance of Ukraine, Bel Belarus, and Poland. It would be organized along the north-south axis, running from Scandinavia to Iran, including Greece, of course, on both sides of the Baltic Sea. The Rzeczpospolita, the Commonwealth, would be a separate geopolitical space distinguished both from the EU, which is rotten, and the Eurasian Union, which is aggressive. So in a way, he wants to incorporate the Byzantine project of joining rivers. Well, ideas have consequences. Of course, it's a sheer fantasy at this stage, but I like to fantasize. Why not? Especially since it's deals away with ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is, is exclusive. Who has taken a DNA test? Well, except for Dr. Mastrapa. Mm -hmm. Here is a joke from Hungary. One of the leaders of uh, radical nationalist Yobi, which is the third largest party in the parliament, uh, found out that he was Jewish. <laughs> Nobody is more surprised than he. In fact, I think his grandfather was a rabbi. But that's for me, that's really funny. Poetic justice. Uh, at any rate, Paul Goebel in his window on Eurasia reports that, uh, according to Nizam Vissimaya's uh, Gazeta, Kiev, having failed to obtain military assistance from NATO, seeks ties with Poland and Lithuania in the military field. Uh, some observers think this may be a new Guam, but others say no, no, this is about defense, this is not about energy or economy only. Guam, uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, and Moldova. Well, the Russians, the Moscovites, say it's a NATO front so that Lithuania and Poland could supply Ukraine surreptitiously with weapons. 
Uh, I wish that was the case that NATO really wanted to do anything, meaning help anybody. But NATO can't help itself. If there is no American leadership, there is none from the White House, we're leading from behind. Nobody's going to do anything. So again, another fantasy. But what a nice fantasy. Instead of talking about Polish lords and killing everybody who's not like me, they're talking about cooperation in the intermarium. I like it. And this is not just on the military field, which obviously for Ukraine is of paramount importance. It's also as far as uh, infrastructure. Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine have been negotiating with Latvia off and on to revive the Baltic Black Sea waterway. It worked splendidly until 1914. Some of the first elements were designed in the 18th century by none and our Thaddeus Kosciuszko. Some of the locks in the lakes of, in the lakes of Missouri. That was him. He designed it. This is going to be, or supposed to be, a Vistula Dnieper a, a waterway. Cheap transport. It would stimulate trade, it would benefit chiefly the landlocked Belarus. When I was uh, last time in Belarus, I uh, heard tall tales about this project. Even the, especially the government was excited. I think on the Belarus side, the locks are ready, and at least that fragment to, uh, from more or less from Grodno, could go. It could work on the Vistula, all the way to Augustov. It would help even local border traffic, as opposed to trains. The Turks and Scandinavians are interested because it goes north, south, and that's very unusual. We are used to the east-west exchange mm -hmm. only. So an alternative trading and transportation route would be, would be good. The Latvians initially explored the possibility, but they are against it. Because their river Dagava, which was supposed to link with uh, the Dnieper, may be endangered. So for environmental reasons, they don't think it's feasible. Well, the, the Greens in Poland object. But usually when you pay the Greens off, they lay off, in Poland at least. Usually when there is a road constructed in Poland, a highway, a, the Greens show up and talk about an endangered species and then there is a donation to their favorite charity and they're happy and silent. I, I'm speaking from experience at the Ministry of Transportation. So even though it sounds like I'm joking, I'm not joking. Uh, at least we could work on a um, little segment of this project, Augusto Grodno Brest. I can tell you that waterways are more eco-friendly than freeways or railways. I don't know it would, if it would be economically feasible, there would be enough traffic, because it can get pricey. But at least at the beginning of, the, uh, of this millennium, an Icelandic bank promised to um, fund it to the tune of $10 billion. I don't think it's still in the cards. But what I'm, su what I'm suggesting here is not a pipe dream. What I'm suggesting is that for the first time, the nations of the Intermarium have begun to relax to relax and try to find solutions that would bind them together, as opposed to putting them at the lower ends. And the key is working together. Whether or not we can have the winged hussars back, 
whether or not we can restore the Commonwealth. Yes. Whether or not I can uh, lodge a claim against the government of Russia to have their states restored, confiscated from my family with Catherine the Great 250 years ago. I'm just joking. But the point being is there is again change afoot in the intermarry. And if those people don't move their butts, then Berlin and Moscow will for them and it will be to the detriment of everybody, including war, world peace. Remember a pattern for almost 300 years. Moscow and Berlin woo each other, they kill Poland, but then they have a necrophilic orgy over Poland's dead body, and then we have a world war. We don't want any of that. Thank you very much. I'm not really familiar with the intermarium. Yes, Mr. Stena will show you a map. If he can warm it up again, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's not a problem. Maybe in, in the same it's, vein, to those of us, and I think I might be the only one novice at this, where does the intermarium name? The land? Oh, in between the seas. In the seas. Seas. Marium. So when was this point? Or where was it used? Well, it's in Latin. It was used on old maps. Uh, it's been, what you would call, it's been around forever. I hear there was an encyclopedia in the 19th century. And the, and the entry for the horse was, what well, the horses, everybody knows. <laughs> sort of, that kind of a thing. I call it intermarium in Polish, it's Międzymorze. It's equally complicated in Ukraine you know, and in all other local languages. Don't, don't even make me say it in Estonian. <clears throat> but intermarium is, uh... oh, you see? Oh. Okay. We're going to Greece. See, this is the intermarium. Uh, the the the, the uh, version minimum is from the Black to Baltic Sea. Version maximum is to the Adriatic, so it's all the seas here, all the way down to Greece, and everything between Estonia and Greece. And when you spoke about those, that, that waterway, north-south waterway, is the that... The Dnieper and Vistula, I'll show you. Very <coughs> Can you actually connect various rivers? Yes, the Varangians used to sail the meaning Vikings yeah. all the way to the Byzantine Empire. The, the ones who liked to sail took the roundabout route around Europe and then go to the but the ones who liked to row went through here. And there were fragments where they would carry their boats <laughs> or rather roll them on logs. Uh, but yes, this operated. This operated. And then, until 1914, from the 18th century, it operated too. It was all connected, and there were... Uh, uh, there was a fair amount of traffic. It's order with Greece. does not include Greece. They are welcome to come. Not the Irish. <laughs> See, this is it. I always say we have to have a map. But nobody ever listens to me. This is more or less the intermarry. Lands between the Black and Baltic Seas. 
we can include the, uh, the Adriatic. There, there were ideas during the Second World War of a Polish Czech, a Czechoslovak Federation, and then eventually uh, with other places associated. I think, realistically speaking, there would have to be about 50 more years of peace for Ukrainians and others to relax, to entertain a, a, a project of some kind of union. Right now, everybody's thinking defense, and everybody's really scared of, of Moscow, really. not so much of Germany, because Germany is not uh, awakened yet. Germany is really reluctant to realize that it's won World War II, World War I, and it's free to take anything it wants. Germany is really still traumatized from the defeat on the battlefield. And it, it, it's incapable of realizing the fruits of economic and political victory. Because we had to build Germany up after destroying it to counter communism. That's ironic, but that's, that's exactly what happened. Under this map, how do you put the former Yugoslavia and Albania? Uh, how important? Well, if you want to do anything in Western Balkans, you should have stability there. And no, no, no. I mean, you, you, oh, you, in the, you yes, the ABC. Inside or out? Inside. inside. It would, it, it, the, it all inclusive version is ABC Adriatic, Black, uh, Black and uh, Baltic. So, all, all the seas. Okay. The Intermarium. Plan minimum is just Black Sea to uh, Baltic Sea, but all inclusive is with the Adriatic Sea coast. Go ahead. If I may, I have a brief comment uh, with regard to the second song in Belarusian, because I'm a Belarusian myself, <laughs> and I can easily uh, relate uh, to the message of that song. But uh -huh. it, the song is not about Polish nobility, it's about Lithuanians and Belarusians. If I can tell you what the Moscovites called no. the knights from the... Well, just hear me out. In all the Lietopisi, the Moscovites would say Litovce when they meant nobility of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Well, and that's I'm my Belarusian, family. So I, I am I from... Count. My family is from the province of Mstislav. You guys are from the west. Um, well, Do you know where Mstislav is? I was born and grew up in Belarus. And, uh, well, that's... Where is it? So. Let me, let me... I'll go on. ...for my comment. Uh, so, oh, wow. um, Litvini and Belarusi. Uh -huh. uh, this is the name that uh, uh, it's interchangeable in many ways. It's yeah. not what Russians, Moscovites called uh, Belarusians. Litvini was a typical normal name for that territory, for those people. Yes. Uh, so, um, and if you try to analyze the sentiment of youth, of patriotic youth, uh, nationalistic youth in Belarus, it's not, it's not very, um, uh, it's not very agitated, or rather, it's not very excited about the Polish nobility. And You're it's absolutely past, right. And it's past. It is excited about its own past, about Lithuania and about Belarus. So uh, there's this strong trend of reviving nationalistic sentiments in Belarusian society, especially among younger population. Uh, in contrast, uh, people, many people in Belarus and youngsters as well, they're wary of the sentiments in Poland because Poland was always a sort of very um, ambitious power, and uh, it, it eyes even, even even today it calls uh, the Western territories of Belarus and Ukraine Soviet Kresy, mm -hmm. kind of giving giving some sort of message that. These territories once belonged to uh, to Poland. Between World War One, World War Two, those territories were occupied by Poland, and you remember it well, of course. Uh, so these twenty years, the uh, the uh, the Poland uh, started calling these territories Skorpikresi, and uh, this does not make many people in Belarus happy, actually, to know that uh, these territories are called Sankresi. Uh, so this is my comment. And uh, I, I would challenge your assumption that people are very uh, excited about Polish nobility. They're more excited about their own identity and their own past.
uh, my question, and uh, I see a bit of contradiction in your message. Uh, you're saying that uh, 50 years of peace would uh, give a chance for people to relax in that region and uh, build intermarium. But at the same time, uh, we see that this conversation about common defense uh, it is driven by concerns, by threats mm -hmm. from the East in this particular case. So, what do you think would be the main driver of uh, intermarriage? Peace or threat? Uh, the intermarriage need peace, needs peace to uh, put itself back together. And of course, a threat gives a spur to all activities that uh, help elucidate a policy and a stance to counter the threat. Now, let me go back to what you said about um, uh, the youth of Belarus in pursuit of its identity. You just made my point. Uh, most of nationalist outfits in Belarus are ethno-nationalist. They invent the past. If you look at textbooks, Polish textbooks say that the Battle of Warsaw was a Polish victory. Uh, Muscovite textbooks say that it was also a Polish victory. Western textbooks say the same thing. Belarusians say it's Belarusian victory. Uh, and the Ukrainians, there was a Ukrainian victory. Lithuanian, Samogitians, Zmudzin, they say it was theirs. The fact is, it was the Polish nobility. As people with coats of arms, 80% of them were Orthodox, Ruthenian, and by ethnicity. You understand? They were There's not no Polish. such term in Belarus as Polish nobility. There's just nothing like that. At all. Well, there is nobility. I'm, but I'm speaking. Shlachta. Shlachta, which Shlachta. means Shlachta. nobility. But this is not Polish. It is Polish. This is a Polish word because you guys had boyars. My family was boyars. You see, this, this, this here is a problem with your ethno-nationalism. It's not a problem. It's a problem of uh, consistency between different ideologies and well, different but, approaches. No, 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 I don't have, I'm a historian, I don't... This is not a problem of Belarusian ethno-identity or something like this. It's a problem of perception by Poles. No, actually, I, my family is from the province of Mstislav, who used to be Orthodox. My name was Hojtko Boreko, we, are, we were boyars, the Poles gave us coats of arms and we became the Polish Szlachta. Eventually we became Polonized and Catholic, but first we were Calvinists in the 17th century. Uh, Ethno-nationalists believe in a mythical folk and some kind of a folk unity and I'm very sorry that in Belarus, among the young, the most popular orientation is Bandera. They admire that. Yes, I have encountered in my studies and in my uh, travels Belarusian nationalists who attempt to model themselves on the ethno-nationalists of Ukraine. So I understand, but once again, Szlachta meant citizenship. Szlachta is a Polish word and a Polish uh, concept. The boyars had no rights. The nobility or Szlachta, had rights. That was the difference. After the union of Horodle, the Poles gave us rights. For instance, the Grand Dukes of Lithuania ran a patrimonial state and the Ruthenian boyars could not own the land. Very simple. The minute they became Polish nobility, no matter what their ethnicity and religion, they could own land. They were no longer subject to a patrimonial state. Nobility meant citizenship, like in America. We say we are American citizens and nobody debates or disputes that you can be Irish or Greek or anything else and you're still an American. That's what Schlachta meant. Nobility. Okay. All right. Yes. The way you disparage, but I don't disparage them. You know, the way you disparage uh, the Belarusian search for itself is is a pity, because every nation has started out feeling its way, and and the process is 
perspective becomes much more poignant and sharp when you have had others denying the existence of that nation. But if you look, if you look at, if you look at, if you look at Bohemia, mm -hmm. Bohemia was the the center of the Holy Roman Empire for quite a, a time, and um, Czech, the language was at the same level as any other developed uh, European language in the 14th century. The same level. Mm -hmm. By 1790, the Czech language, after 170 years of Austro-Hungarian occupation of uh, Bohemia and Moravia, the Czech language was reduced to maybe 1,500 words, like bucket and straw and cow. Well, and it took the, the absolutely bloody-minded efforts of, at first, a very few people who were considered to be mad, first to revive the language, and, and then to start to think about what narod Naro in Czech, what it meant, and it was very much, um, there was very much an ethnic component to that. In, the, in Belarus, you've had um, uh, much more from Muscovy, uh, but unfortunately, in uh, the Polish Republic, the interwar Polish Republic, you also had a, a denial of the distinctiveness of Belarusians. And one of the problems with the interwar Belarusian nationalist movements was that they were totally run by the uh, by Moscow. They were they they'd been totally penetrated. It was part of the same uh, approach that the trust worked on uh, out of Moscow. Uh, you you you, uh, you penetrate groups and you you buy them and then you guide them. But ordinary Belarusians felt very much that they were different from Poles and Ukrainians and certainly from Russians. Today, you're going, again, you're going to have people in Belarus who are finding their way back to their history. Because their history, uh, Moscow, Petersburg and Moscow, uh, that is to say, Tsarist Russia, and then uh, the, the incarnation under the Soviets, and then the uh, Russia since 1991, have denied the existence of separate strong languages, Belarus and Ukrainian. They've denied that people had any kind of separate history. They expropriated the name Rus anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. Rus, as you know, and as you've said before, it has nothing to do with Moscow. Absolutely nothing. It was, it was stolen. Same thing with the, the idea of the third, the, the third Rome. Stolen. Belarusians are going through uh, all sorts of interesting searches. Uh, the big debate there is really between whether you define Belarus as something separate from Poland and separate from Russia, or you define Belarus and acknowledge the Litvin and the, the Russian past, which was uh, uh, expressed in the Grand Duchy, much more so than in the, the Rechbos Polit. I think there's much more sympathy in Belarus for the idea of the Grand Duchy. But yes, there are people who, who look back to uh, Belarus as part of something larger, but they also see that they they had a, a separate, they were growing a separate identity. So uh, that's one thing. A pluribus unum. Sorry? A pluribus unum. Okay, but, uh, but uh, What's going on? There's a ferment in Belarus. All right. The second part is you, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about Orban, and you mentioned Christianity. Christianity is the basis for our civilization. Yes. The problem with Christianity is Christians, that, and I say that <laughs> as a as a as a very conservative uh, uh, Anglican. I say that about Protestants, Roman Catholics, or Orthodox. Problems with the hierarchy. Um, you know, it, 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 you've got the the the, the, the Grand Inquisitor. Temptation. Uh, you've got corruption, both um, venal and moral, in in churches. And the worst thing that can happen to our faith is to have politicians expropriate it, because politicians. I mean, that's Caesar. That's Caesar's realm. And Christianity will only be able to come back and take its rightful place again 
including in, in a, some new European uh, EU constitution where it's been excised to the destruction of Europe. It will only do so when it comes from below. It, it, hierarchies and politicians can only ruin our faith. They can talk about religion. Religion is not faith. Religion is a vehicle. But our faith, again, of whatever confession, is only going to be able to uh, to come back uh, before the second coming, uh, you know, whenever that is going to be. Uh, it's going to, only going to be able to come back if people live it rather than proclaim it as some connection with some connection to a, a, a national uh, ideology. In my view. Um, yes, but after 50 years of uh, physically trying to exterminate yes. religion. It's always good to see someone powerful who says, hey, I believe in Jesus Christ. Of course it's good, but let him live his faith. Yeah. Well, he uh, used to be quite libertine, and because of his wife, I, again, I'm not in Orban's soul, so I can't tell you what he really thinks, but because of his wife, apparently he has uh, uh, reverted to the religion of his ancestors, and that's why as every zealot, he may be a little bit overzealous. Well, uh, maybe he's following St. Augustine. Fine. Maybe he is. Maybe he is. But now I don't want you uh, to think ever that I disparage anything, uh, including Russian. I never have denied uh, the existence of the Russian nationality. In fact, it was a, uh, my friend's great grandfather who was in the forefront of uh, the Belarusian national movement in the 19th century. His name was Voeko, Michal Korvin Voeko. I think you guys call him Voleka. He, he would agree, because that's just how it is pronounced. And in your language, he was a Polish noble and a Belarusian. That's what he thought about himself. A white Ruthenian, actually, he would say about himself. It's a, it's a very complex thing, and it's very hard to explain not only to an American audience, but also uh, to uh, uh, Belarusians, what is meant by all of this. It sounds very Talmudic to outsiders. And the fact is very simple. There was a multi-ethnic commonwealth. What it had in common was the Shlachta. The Shlachta originated in Polish medieval chivalry, knighthood, with corporate rights which were bestowed upon us in the East. Some or most of the nobility became Catholic eventually and became Polonized because that was Westernization. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Sim. I'd like to add something because in, in history, as questioned Belarus, Ukraine, there's this view that somehow the Commonwealth was Polish imperialism, the Polish crown was occupying those Ruthenian lands, whereas, in fact, the Polish crown, the kingdom, was constantly preoccupied with defending those lands from the Muscovites. So, instead of regaining Pomerania and Silesia... He's from central Poland. They, 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 had, had, to, they had to the pool. wars with Moscovy, that's true. Oh, that so, shows that he's from yeah. central Poland, because uh, we in Belarus, <laughs> we had to face this threat from the east all the time yeah. and we took all the damage I know. and uh, Poland in its turn could take advantage of this because they could when, whenever necessary they could support this defense against the uh, Moscovites mm -hmm. and uh, Mos demand certain uh, yeah. uh, my, Moscovite, certain my, my Moscovite friends say oh they are any white and gray so they say oh mare who defended you from the Mongols? They are Mongols. They are. <laughs> exactly. So either from the, the Muscovites or from the Teutonic Knights. They're very good Knights. friends of mine. <laughs> or from the Teutonic Knights, because the best contingent at Grunwald was what? I would like Polish. to invite you and you and then Mr. Sterna to take three consecutive intermarium lectures to explain this all. Because I think we're losing the audience. I'm not kidding. If you're ready to speak about this, I'll be very happy to have you here. Anytime you're ready. And uh, talk among yourself. Remember, I'm uh, firmly parked in the 17th century. 
if I don't feel too comfortable with mother, modern ethno-nationalism, and I'll let you know about it. And I'm further to the east than any of you guys. Mestizla. Do you know what that is? <laughs> Very far east. Slavia, please. I'm sorry? Mr. Okay. And that's how my answer switched off a long time ago. Any more questions? One more question, and we have to uh, make ourselves scarce. I think there's a class. No, well, thank you so much. Let's have fun again very soon. If I don't see you, Merry Christmas or whatever floats your boat. Thank you. <laughs>